Discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. Florida legislators go to Tallahassee to put forth legislation to benefit their constituents. Behind all change in state or federal laws are a team of advocates, a variety of working professionals, and state or federally mandated councils, like the Florida Developmental Disability Council, proclaimed by Governor Rick Scott. Supporters celebrated House Bill 1119 and Senate Bill 142, known as the Intellectual Disabilities Bill, which will change reference from mental retardation in state statutes to intellectual disabilities. A two-part press conference began with the arc of Florida's president, Michelle Poole. She recognized Florida leaders who gathered in strong support of the bills, like Florida Representative Janet Atkins and Florida Senator Thad Allman, whose commitment fueled the bill's momentum and support from our state cabinet to Governor Scott and Representative Janet Atkins have both filed bills that will help end the R word in Florida. My name is Janet Atkins. I serve in the Florida House of Representatives, House District 11. People with intellectual disabilities deserve respect. And that's one of the reasons why I filed House Bill 1119. It is important that we replace the term mental retardation with intellectual disability in our laws. Federal health education and labor policy statutes were changed in 2010 when Congress passed and our president signed into law Rosa's Law. 39 states have changed their law. The R word has become hurtful slang yeah. that promotes negative stereotypes of people with intellectual disabilities. And now it's time for Florida to make that change and to end the R word. Hopefully this would be the year that we, uh, we use the proper term, we give the proper respect, and we reflect the proper values. The words mean things, and, uh, um, and, and, and we believe that, that this bill will put, put uh, individuals in, in the proper perspective and respect them as a productive and meaningful citizens they are. So it's a great honor to do this bill, a great honor to you. Advocates shared their real life experiences. Meet Maura Rossi, advocate of the Ark of Jacksonville, actively representing those with intellectual disabilities throughout the state. People call me the R word. This makes me feel sad and bullied. But we now have an opportunity to change that with the Intellectual Disabilities Bill. Self-advocate Patricia Moody from Vero Beach let her fellow supporters in on her many talents. In being fluent in sign language, I am a violinist, a singer, and a huge movie fan. I also have Down syndrome. When someone makes fun of you, it's something you remember for a very long time. People who use the R word are mean. They hurt individuals with disabilities. And end the R word in Florida. Yeah. Derek Sneed of Monticello, Florida, voiced his opinion on the R word. People sing retarded, and I said respect someone. Parent advocacy is a fundamental element in a child's early development. Parents involved in early intervention is crucial for the child and family's benefit, socially and financially, throughout their lifetime. I am fighting for my daughter who has intellectual disabilities. But because of the support of advocates, laws have changed. And it will make things easier for my daughter and give her more rights. Patty McCartney expressed her commitment to her child and the community. How old is Delaney? She's going to be seven next week. Seven years, seven old. years old. So do we have her? In, we have her in early steps and all the great programs, yep, right? Yeah, she was in early steps. Now she's in first grade. 
So Patty, as a parent advocate, yes. can you explain to me what is your role here today? Um, I'm here with um, my organization, PARC, which stands for Providing Advocacy Recognizing Capabilities. And we're here to um, try to get more understanding for people with developmental disabilities. Mothers like Patty are caregivers 24-7 for their children. The ARC of Florida, the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, known as APD, and the Florida Developmental Disability Council recently celebrated Governor Rick Scott's budget recommendation to provide $36 million for the APD Medicaid waiver waiting list. So I announced my Florida Families First budget about a month ago. Uh, in that I included $36 million to provide critical services to provide people who are on the Agency for Persons with Disabilities wait list, which means that hundreds of families who need support will now be able to get it. During the press conference, Governor Scott honored individuals who have worked for many years in the community and now live in their own home independently. We're going to help more people become independent and get jobs so they can live their version of the American dream. He also presented Corrine Kelleher with the Adelio Valdez Award for creating disability awareness in the workplace and her advocacy in the Sarasota community. This young woman is truly an inspiration, a committed leader in self-advocacy who is always looking for ways to help others. So it's my distinct honor today, right now, to introduce Corinne, the winner of the Adelio Valdez Award. Congratulations. Learn more about developmental disabilities and Florida advocacy by contacting the Florida Developmental Disability Council at www.fddc.org. Florida Independent Living Council's members are appointed by the governor, working together with the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and Blind Services in a united effort to break down the barriers of everyday life. Are you getting this, honey? Oh, prime time. We are rolling. <laughs> All right, Mama's going to bring it home. Mama's okay. going to bring it home. Okay. 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 Come on. Watch this, guy. Oh, oh the backwards. Oh, Woo! don't. Oh. Okay. It went into Bob and Carol's yard. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Here it goes. Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. All right, let's see what you can do. Let's go. They might surprise you. Search We Can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. Florida has over 875,000 married working moms and over 430,000 single working mothers. Did you know an average mom spends 18 hours a week cleaning and organizing their home? In addition to transporting kids to school, after school activities, organizing play dates, and a variety of personal responsibility, and some includes caregiving. Lifestyle and parenting expert Tara Aronson is here with time-saving tips to help mom spend more time with her family and keep her cool and be organized. Good morning, Tara. Good morning, Rosalie. So how can busy moms spend less time on cleaning routines around the house? Well, I would say that you, if you add a simple task to everything you're already doing, so for example, when you're making coffee, you go ahead and wipe down the countertops or wipe down the inside of the microwave. And when you're cooking, make sure you wash and put things away as you go. You can pretty much cut your cleaning time in half. So just double duty, double up on what you're doing, and you can have the amount of time you're spending every week. That's probably the simplest way. How do you handle everyday messes when there isn't a lot of time to clean up? You should keep everything together. I mean, it, and, and it, ideally, it should be something that's portable. So, for example, this is my cleaning caddy. I, it, they don't have to look like anything special. They just have to be able to hold all of the things you need. The cleaners, the scrubbers, paper towels. And I actually prefer paper towels over dishcloths. Dishcloths can really redeposit millions of germs back onto your surfaces which of course defeats the purposes. And I love Bounty's new Dura Towels because they act like a cloth, they feel and clean like a cloth, but you can actually throw away the dirt and the mess. One of the things that should be on everyone's list is cleaning your dishwasher. If you have smart products, if you choose the right products, like these new Cascade Platinum Packs, it actually cleans the inside of your dishwasher as well as your dishes. What tips can you share to enlist the kids to participate and be responsible to do their share of chores 
around the house. But when my son was about two, I would have him help me sort the clothes. It didn't actually help me so much, but he thought it did, but it's a start. I mean, initially, they're not gonna be that much help, but the idea is to get them used to cleaning, thinking that it, they live there, it's their responsibility too. And laundry, I think, I, I always bring up because it's probably the thing that I do most every week. So getting the kids to do laundry, getting them started by separating the colors when they're younger, and then move up to operating the machines. You can also help ensure success, or at least it worked for me. My son could never remember to put whites in hot water. So I use the Tide detergent. It doesn't redeposit the dirt if you're not using the right water temperature. So he always succeeded. The kid still does his laundry, never complains about it. Tara, moms need some time out, whether married or single. So why is helping her around the house and keeping some order the best gift a mom can receive? What gift could be better than time? And that really is what you're doing. And actually, you're giving a little love with your time. So I bet it could be better. So that is probably the best thing you could do. Where can we get some more time-saving housekeeping tips? Tips. Well, you'll find more about the products I told you about at pgeveryday.com. And I actually put on my website some tips on uh, what kids can do at what age around the house, and you'll find that at mrscleanjeans.com. Did you know nearly one in five Florida children is at risk of hunger due to limited access to nutritious foods? Well, ask Lauren Bush Lauren, model and humanitarian with one of the most famous names in the world. Her uncle and her grandfather were presidents. Her father-in-law is fashion legend Ralph Lauren. And Lauren is the co-founder and CEO of Feed Projects, a personal effort to fight hunger around the world. She's joined this morning by the president and CEO of Clarence, Jonathan Sarin. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Lauren, tell us how you got involved in feeding hungry children and your latest project with Feed. Sure, I um, first got involved when I was a student I had the amazing opportunity to travel around the world with the UN World Food Program. So through that lens, really learned about hunger and poverty firsthand. You know, 100 million children worldwide are underweight, meaning they don't have enough food and nutrition to, to really sustain them and, and allow them to develop properly. Um, so seeing that, you know, it's very disheartening. Yet I saw a lot of amazing programs that are really helping children, and, and one of those is school feeding. So in the poorest countries around the world, children are receiving a free nutritious school lunch, which means that it, it may be the only meal they'll get a day, but it has the vitamins and, and nutrients they need. And it really encourages children to go to school to receive that school lunch. So it's a program I really um, fell in love with and wanted to support and wanted really to um, create a way for other people to support it as well, um, including young people who may not have a big checkbook to write a big you know, a, a big donation to a, a UN organization, yet they want to do something. And that's, that's why it's out of feed. And, and the newest partnership and program we're doing is with Clarence. Clarence has been a long-term partner of feed, which I'm personally so grateful for. Um, and together so far, we've been able to give 1.5 million meals, which is huge. And through this new gift with uh, p purpose program we're doing um, exclusively at Macy's, we hope to give one million school meals. Jonathan, how did Clarence get involved in this initiative? Clarence is a privately owned company and, and a family company and uh, we've all, uh, we are encouraged by, our, by the founder of Clarence and by his sons to always find uh, in every country where we are and we are available in, in, in 100 countries uh, a local partner so we can give it back. Uh, the family has, has uh, very strong values and they always want to be a, a corporate citizen. Uh, and uh, we were very impressed with uh, the work of Lauren. She managed to find a, a way of, uh, of creating a, a cause and, and a creative charity that is above scalable uh, and uh, sustainable. And um, we partner with Macy's because Macy's can give us this uh, national audience uh, to kind of redefine what, what is the gift we purchase into the gift we purpose instead of uh, just receiving a bag with a uh, traveling size of, uh, of uh, a brand you receive uh, a bag that uh, provides for 10 meals and you receive also uh, six pieces of our iconic products. How does the Feed Project work on a local level in Florida? 
you know, we, we want uh, uh, customers to discover uh, the feed program and, and what uh, Macy's can offer us is, is a national stage. Uh, Clarence is available in many different retailers, but uh, uh, we have uh, more than 400 stores in, in, uh, in America with, with Macy's. Um, so we partner with Macy's. They're going to give us uh, both stage, the theater at, at counter, but also the audience because uh, it will be available on Macy's.com. It will be available in some of the catalogs and the pieces that uh, communication piece that they do. Uh, and uh, we will uh, contribute by, by uh, giving away this, these bags that are, are filled with our products and at our sell time will provide 10 meals. Our goal with Macy's and with Feed is uh, to provide for 1 million meal in one year uh, throughout this promotion and another promotion in fall. Lauren, how many children do you hope to reach this year? You know, unfortunately, there is such a need um, abroad and here in our backyard, as you mentioned earlier. So we really, you know, want to continue to reach as many people as we can, especially children, um, again, with the food and nutrition they need. So. We don't per se have a number goal. To date, we've been able to give nearly 60 million school meals, which is something we're very proud of. This is one amazing truffle tree. Can you imagine a place where these grow everywhere? Yes, it's called the forest, a magical place to enjoy with your family. So discover the forest and explore all the wonder that's there. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Women with a poor diet who avoid exercise face a significant breast cancer risk according to a study published in Cancer Epidemiology, Biomakers and Prevention. So what goes on in the mind of almost 1.4 million Americans each year when they hear the words, you've got cancer, and instantaneously their lives change forever. The Cancer Experience, a national study of patients and caregivers, is a first of its kind study Steve Bonner, President and CEO of Cancer Treatment Centers of America, joins us this morning to discuss the survey findings and ways to improve cancer care now and in the future. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Cancer patients must feel overwhelmed with the emotional and physical stress of knowing they must make the decisions to seek the best advances in clinical and medical treatments to save their lives. This is a big personal responsibility. What did the survey find about patient and caregivers' issues to help them get past this life-altering experience? Well, you're so right. This is such an attention-grabbing and almost um, life-stopping diagnosis. And what this survey tells us is first, how smart cancer patients and their family members are about what they need, what they want, and what they expect in order to help them beat cancer. Number two, it tells us how we're doing as an industry across all providers in delivering what it is they're looking for. And the first striking finding here is that one in four cancer patients are dissatisfied with the care that they've received. Number two, as you suggest, these people are very willful. This is their life and they're going to take control as they seek the care that, that they value and that's going to give them their best chance to beat cancer. So 20% of these patients have left the first place they went for care and gone someplace else because they believe they're going to get a better result. What emotional support is needed and offered to caregivers and the patient? They want a quarterback that will help guide them through their care. One person that they know, who knows their cancer, and who can coordinate their care in these very complex organizations. Two-thirds of these patients and caregivers said that's important. Only one-third of them said they got what they needed on that issue. Number two, cancer is not a tumor. Cancer is a body, life, spirit kind of a disease. It, it encompasses everything that a patient lives. As a result, they want holistic and integrative care. They want a team that's going to work together 
to support their full, um, their full immune system and get down to the cellular level. And 90% of these patients said they needed that type of uh, wholly integrated care, and less than 70% said that they were getting it. And the third major component is managing their pain. And this was very interesting because the, the caregivers cared more about the pain management than even the patients. And the, the caregivers said two-thirds want very high quality pain management, less than 50% were able to get it. So with these three elements, we've got a huge opportunity to listen to the patients, listen to the family members, and improve the care that we're delivering. What are some of the gaps found in cancer treatment that results in negative reactions by patients and caregivers? There are these three major gaps, um, a care coordinator, um, that is personalized and is mine to work with, um, a holistic integrative style of care, a team that's going to take care of my care and understand me, uh, managing my pain and being able to make sure that, that I have my pain under control. As a result, I'm able to stay with my care and keep forging ahead and be able to achieve the best possible result. And as we respond to this, we're going to find quality of care is going to go up, Outcomes are going to improve, they're going to live longer, they're going to live a better um, quality of life, uh, their satisfaction is going to go up, and we're also going to find we're going to be able to take unnecessary cost out because we're going to be delivering what they want and not delivering what they don't value. One million Americans live with Parkinson's and 60,000 more are diagnosed each year with 4% diagnosed before the age of 50. Statistics show men are more likely to have Parkinson's disease than women. Parkinson's is a chronic progressive neurological disease that affects movement. Professional Football Hall of Famer Forrest Gregg spent 40 years fighting for victory on the field. In 2011, Forrest was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and began the biggest battle of his life. Greg joins us this morning to share his story as told in a reality-style video series for Parkinson's More Than Motion community. Joining Greg is Parkinson's expert, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, a movement disorder specialist. Forrest, tell us, when did you start noticing symptoms of Parkinson's and how did your wife help you understand what was happening to you. There are things about yourself that you don't even notice. For example, when I first started having hand tremors, I, I didn't have any idea my hand was trembling until she brought it to my attention. Uh, also, my vivid dreams. The uh, best thing she could do was to, to wake me up in the middle of the night if I was having one of these things. And uh, it just goes on and on and on with fatigue uh, it, it is, a, is a part of it. Uh, uh, just there's a motion part of it and then there's more than motion. If a person thinks that they are experiencing Parkinson's symptoms, how should they proceed and what can a person do to address this issue? I first see my doctor and maybe get a recommendation to for a neurologist who deals in this thing daily. And uh, there's information online, uh, the Facebook uh, Parkinson's more than motion. And uh, find out as much as you can about the disease. H how can you help to uh, deal with the symptoms of the disease. What can you do personally? Almost every three to six months, we're discovering a new gene that's responsible for various forms of familial Parkinson's disease. And by understanding what those genes do in brain cells, we are developing new targets, which we hope will be able to 
uh, addressed with new medications that will hopefully slow or stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. We're understanding more about environmental factors, for example, exposure to pesticides or well water or head injury. All these are environmental risk factors which increase one's risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So by better understanding the causes of Parkinson's disease, I think we're getting a long way to developing new treatments, which we hope will result in a cure. Education is of great importance to Parkinson's patients and caregivers. So how can they begin communicating with their doctors more effectively? Education may not know what to discuss with their physician. I know that uh, Mr. Greg and his wife Barbara have uh, learn to be extremely well prepared when they come to see me. They come with a careful list of notes and they discuss with me all the different things. And if they didn't know about Parkinson, they may not recognize that those things are things that are part of Parkinson or things that could be treated. So where can our viewers go to find more information and become more educated on how to care for a loved one with Parkinson? The public can reach is on Facebook and they can search Parkinson's More Than Motion. This is a very interesting reality video series featuring patients and families and how they deal with Parkinson's disease to illustrate to the public how patients can maintain a high quality of life and what they themselves can do. This uh, website features information on the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, such as tremor, which was one of Forrest's first symptoms in the left hand, slowness, stiffness, and impaired balance. But also, importantly, we're trying to bring attention to the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, such as trouble with mood or depression, fatigue, abnormal sleep and vivid dreams, control of bladder and bowel, we know that as the disease progresses, these non-motor symptoms can often be the greatest source of disability. So by arming the public with education, we believe that patients and families can then interact best with their healthcare team to treat their symptoms appropriately and maintain a high quality of life. About 66 million caregivers total 29% of the U.S. adult population that provides care to someone who is ill, disabled, or aged. More women than men are caregivers, taking on 66% of caregiving responsibilities. Advocating for a loved one means being proactive to find the best medical resources available. Women are the nurturers of the world, but sometimes we forget to take care of our own needs to make sure that we care for those we love. Mothers deserve appreciation all year long for all that they give. Share with us how you cared for your mother, stepmother, mother-in-law, or a woman who is special in your life on facebook.com forward slash rose.lee or visit us at rosalieartershow.com. Will the solutions to this show's issues help you or a loved one? Find shows like this and others on our website at rosaliearchershow.com. <laughs>